Um, no, not currently. Hello. Hi, I'm Tom. Hello, Tom. Nice to meet you. Um, yes, you there. Okay, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, this is your pointer. Mm -hmm. The buttons are the same as for your pointer, except for this one. will kill the screen. Okay, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> yeah. if, if it does happen, <laughs> just press it again. Okay, sorry, this is the laser? This is the laser pointer yeah. here. Oh, the front. front. Yeah. And, the, and the joystick <laughs> thing in the middle, uh, just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Hey Lewis. How you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Fantastic. Um you press that button, I'll point it the screen will die. Okay, so don't press that. If you do press it, just press it again. Yeah, sure. Right. I need to make a rapid escape and it's a distraction. <laughs> Yes, okay. Set all these up yesterday, so they should be. Yeah, hang on. Is Fabio here? Okay. Yeah, okay. But she's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Thomas Davies. I'm your chair for this session on ecosystem ecology and function uh, novel approaches. At the talks, uh, speakers please will last for 13 minutes with two minutes for questions. At five minutes, uh, Nim here will show you a five minutes to go card. At one minute, I will stand up and start looking imposing. Okay. Um, fantastic. So. Good morning is Andrew Barnes, who is going to be talking to us about energy flux, the foundational link between multi-trophic biodiversity and ecosystem function. Take it away, Andrew. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, so, today I'm going to be presenting um, a concept that uh, some colleagues and I have been working on that, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be proposing that energy fluxes themselves are actually a really good way of uh, integrating multitrophic biodiversity, so this idea of biodiversity across multitrophic levels into uh, research uh, into ecosystem functioning. <coughs> so, um, firstly, um, as many of you are well aware, humans are having uh, vast impacts on the globe, and uh, perhaps one of the, the most noticeable impacts we're having is increased extinction rates uh, beyond historical levels of extinctions. And uh, this has raised a lot of questions about what these, uh, these losses of species um, might, um, might have on ecosystem processes. So um, this really nice figure, it sort of shows how, um, whether it's uh, taxonomic or phylogenetic uh, or functional diversity, um, these uh, loss of these uh, different <coughs> types of diversity are likely to have some sort of impact on ecosystem functioning. And um, this question uh, led to some rather famous experiments that began in um, sort of the early 90s that um, specifically uh, looked at, um, or that manipulated grassland diversity. And they then looked at the relationship between different levels of grassland diversity uh, and ecosystem functioning. And generally this was mostly expressed as uh, plant biomass. But um, of course, uh, the majority of these experiments were at, at a single trophic level. Perhaps if they included different trophic levels, they tended to look at these individual trophic levels, but in isolation from each other, and the uh, individual functions that these different trophic levels carried out. But um, what happens when we start incorporating different trophic levels is that we have a, a bit of a mess, uh, sort of a, a tangled bird's nest that looks a bit like this, where multiple trophic levels are interacting with each other, and of course they're having effects on, on the biodiversity of other groups, but also on their ecosystem functioning. So this sort of leads to the question how we can incorporate these uh, sort of realistic level of um, diversity, not just of uh, taxonomic diversity, but diversity of trophic interactions, 
into biodiversity ecosystem functioning re research and, and specifically how we can look at um, uh, yeah, how we can uh, estimate uh, the functional consequences of, of diversity loss or gain, I should say. So, <coughs> um, what I'm proposing today is that energy flux is quite an ideal uh, currency to use to, to um, incorporate this complexity. And essentially, this just looks at uh, fluxes of energy and materials uh, from one uh, trophic group to another. This could be at a species level or, or an entire uh, community, for that matter. And um, what I'm proposing is that, in fact, uh, while this is not necessarily a new idea, the idea of really focusing on energy fluxes as an ecosystem function themselves is perhaps a bit newer. And, and we are proposing this is quite a nice way, actually, to integrate um, multiple trophic levels in, in very complex systems, which are not abnormal, um, that, of course, also span different ecosystems, so from marine to uh, freshwater and terrestrial systems. And in doing so, we can separate these fluxes into different types of interactions, like predation, herbivory, detritivory, or even direct uptake <coughs> of nutrients. I hope you can all see that. Um, and, uh, and many of these functions, um, well, in fact, all of these uh, energy fluxes are in themselves uh, an ecosystem function. So for example, here, number one, we have a predation on, on rodents. And this, uh, of course, directly is, is predation, which is, of course, a function. But it's also, it can be seen as an ecosystem service, so pest control in, um, agro, um, yeah, in agricultural systems. Or, for example, number four, we have um, uh, decomposition, which is driven by um, litter macroinvertebrates and streams. Um, so, so this flux of energy from, from these different pools to another is in, in themselves ecosystem functioning. And so if we can quantify these fluxes, then um, this is a potentially a way to actually incorporate this, this vast complexity that we see in ecosystems and start rethinking biodiversity functioning relationships. So um, here's just a couple of proposed mechanisms that have um, partially come out of uh, biodiversity functioning research. So you might have all heard of the niche complementarity effect, uh, that, that uh, where species diversity drives an increase in functioning because of the partitioning of resource uptake among, um, among uh, species at a single trophic level. And, uh, and so trophic complementarity simply expands us across multiple trophic levels. And we expect then with increasing complementarity, so decreasing niche overlap or competition among um, these, uh, these consumers, you, we should see increases in overall energy flux. And also um, sort of the species <coughs> dominance effect where if, say the introduction or um, or in some cases the loss of a, a keystone species is quite likely going to have some important impacts on ecosystem functioning. Um, also, another important aspect of, of ecosystem functioning is the stability of those functions. And so we can see uh, also mechanisms like generalism, which can be expressed by uh, the, yeah, basically how generalist uh, consumers might be. And so in, in this case here, we see that if, for example, we lost this bottom um, uh, resource species here, then this is likely to have cascading uh, negative effects on, on the consumers that rely on that. But if these consumers, in theory, are, are more generalist, then it's possible that they could switch to, to other prey items and, and continue to persist and carry out this ecosystem function, express this energy flux. And some more um, theoretical work has looked into how the distribution of energy fluxes uh, across food webs can um, also enhance stability. And I'm not going to go into much more detail because I don't have a lot of time. Um, so like I say, there's many other mechanisms, but um, I just want to uh, sort of highlight one study that's really nicely integrated um, two of these mechanisms. Uh, in, in 2014, uh, the study from uh, Guadalupe Peralta and colleagues uh, looked at parasitoid host networks, and um, they, they came up with two nice measures. So one of niche complementarity, uh, which essentially looks at the overlap of, um, of uh, hosts that these parasitoid consumers feed on. And they found that with increasing functional complementarity, uh, they, they did actually find an increase in overall parasitism rates, which is uh, a sort of expression of energy flux between two trophic levels. Um, they also found that by looking at the redundancy of species, so essentially like how general um, some of these uh, consumer species are, so how many, um, how many different uh, host species they could feed on, um, as, as those uh, generalists increase, uh, you see a decrease in spatial variability, marginally significant, but nonetheless, there seems to be a trend there. Um, so, so this is sort of one nice application of how we can actually look into some of these mechanisms of biodiversity functioning, um, incorporating this idea of energy flux between trophic levels in, albeit a relative simple system. 
Um, there's been a whole host of other papers that have come out uh, recently, but this dates uh, very far back. In fact, uh, Daniel Pooley even mentioned today um, the use of uh, EcoPath, and there's th for a long time there's been um, uh, this thought into measuring energy fluxes, um, but uh, there's sort of gradually this uh, greater push towards thinking about this as um, ecosystem functioning itself. So um, from here I just want to point out some uh, what we've been sort of thinking of uh, possible sort of future uh, directions that research could go by incorporating this idea of energy flux into biodiversity functioning research. Um, so I say back to the future, I, I hope you've all seen this movie, this is the DeLorean. Um, <laughs> but uh, essentially th these are not necessarily new ideas, so it's uh, relatively old, but uh, I think that we can start rethinking some of these ideas again and, and incorporate them into future research. So for example, cascading effects in ecosystems. What happens if we remove uh, perhaps, say, a, a, generalist, um, a generalist predator that uh, imposes top-down force on this other predator? <coughs> we might see effects like this, where we get an increase of fluxes to that predator, it imposes top-down force on a herbivore, thanks, and uh, we might then see an increase in uh, biomass production of, of a primary producer. And uh, there, there are many methods to, to calculate energy fluxes, and, and some of them make it quite feasible to do this at a very uh, complex level. And so again, we could look at how uh, the removal, or uh, I say removal, but also it's a good way to look at invasions in ecosystems. Um, but in this case, say if we remove a functional group, what happens to the rest of the food web? So all of these fluxes um, that uh, sort of represent uh, different types of ecosystem functions from detritivory to herbivory. And I think that this gives us a really good opportunity to look into some of these processes. Um, also, again, another cheesy movie reference, uh, <laughs> that's the Star Trek Enterprise, okay. Um, I think that uh, spatial scaling in biodiversity functioning research has been um, perhaps uh, a bit of a challenge for us, and I think this is another good way to be able to approach this problem. So as I've mentioned, ecosystems, of course, span many different habitat types, and uh, this is a really good way to look at, for example, what happens if we see some disturbance in a in a trophic uh, group or functional group that um, spans many <coughs> different habitat types, do we see uh, effects in perhaps below ground, above ground, and, and uh, freshwater systems, and perhaps beyond to, to marine systems? And um, I think if one samples across these systems, it's possible to look into these sort of cross-ecosystem effects. Um, but also actually scaling in, in ecosystems. So uh, what, what we see at the, the plot level, do we also see similar sort of processes happening at the landscape level? and perhaps even at the regional level or global level. And we're actually, um, by calculating energy fluxes, we can quite relatively easily calculate ecosystem function across complex communities, um, really at uh, different spatial scales. And this could allow us to perhaps look into questions like whether or not we see sort of an area energy or uh, ecosystem functioning scaling relationship, uh, for example. So I think there's, there's many other directions uh, that we can go, but uh, I think I'll, I'll leave it with that for now, and uh, yeah, thank uh, all, many of the people who we've been discussing the ideas with, and of course our funders and my working groups. So thank you for listening. Okay, questions for Andrew. <coughs> yes. How does this differ from the International Biological Program and its objective in 1964? I'm going to admit I'm not familiar <laughs> with it. <laughs> all this. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, so like I said, it's not necessarily a new idea. Um, so it was a 10-year program that built ecology internationally mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and then was sort of stepped away from it as a, as a, as a methodology. But anyway, okay. I, I, I raised that point. I will certainly look into this. Yeah, um, so I've actually more recently just started to try and dig back, uh, you know, further back in the ecological history to see if uh, it's, I mean, these ideas are old. And um, I think that, yeah, it's unfortunate that we've sort of, uh, there was some point in time in ecology we kind of tend to, tend to move away from these ideas. I think it's time to come back. So, but I will look into that. More questions for Andrew? Yes. No, it was just, just a point, actually. I think historically what happened is then it all went experimental, small scale, where you could be scientific and rigorous. And the thing <coughs> is, as identified by the International Biology Program, sort of lost out to that. And mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly these, um, these big biodiversity functioning experiments that, you know, starting up in the, in the 90s really 
uh, sort of kicked life back into these sort of ideas, but of course narrowed it down to a very specific focus. So, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes? On what do you base the recalculation of energy fluxes if you lose a species in a complex network? Um, yeah, I probably don't have time to go into the, uh, the specific method that we've been using, but essentially it accounts for um, uh, losses of energy to high trophic levels. Um, because you're, you're balancing um, uh, sort of the sample biomass by intake into a node and then how much is lost through like natural, natural death rates and predation of these nodes. So if you, for example, start losing um, hyotrophic levels, then um, your network needs to account for this. Um, so but does the biomass in the nodes also change accordingly or just the fluxes between the nodes? Um, the biomass can certainly change at the same time as well. So I mean, this can be done in both, uh, say, like a more theoretical modeling approach, or um, or with empirical data um, from yeah your sort of sample data. But yeah, <laughs> sorry, it's quite a brief answer. So as, as a related question, um, can you then manipulate the patterns of dominance across each trophic level and see how that affects the <coughs> energy flux as well? Um, certainly in a modeling framework. Yeah, or um, you know, I could also see it a nice. Uh, Sort of as a nice opportunity to, um, like if you have experimental, some sort of experimental system to actually manipulate um, dominance of different species, because of course that's going to have impacts on, on biomass, but also um, sort of body size distributions of different trophic uh, groups, and that's going to have large or potentially large impacts on, on fluxes of these different groups. So I think it could be done both from a modeling angle or from a, an empirical approach. Okay. Uh, time for one more question. <laughs> Anybody has one? Okay, thank you very much, Andrew. Okay, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Fabio Carvalho Gomez da Silva, and he will be talking to us about determining trait composition of mid to late Holocene <coughs> lowland plant fen communities through the use of fossil pollen assemblages, revealing past ecosystem processes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for coming. So, the work I'm going to be presenting this afternoon, or this morning, sorry, it's uh, focusing on um, estimating the functional composition of Holocene plant communities in Finland environments, and trying to determine whether or not we can use phalaenological studies that use fossil pollen assemblages to potentially review changes in ecosystem processes through time. So a very brief <coughs> word on palynology first. Pollen analysis has traditionally been used to reconstruct uh, vegetation history, especially over the last 100 years or so. So you can see some examples of pollen grains on the right there of the screen. And Finland environments have been particularly useful for doing that because of anaerobic conditions, given the, the, the degree of wetness of, of, the, of the environment, in where pit layers build up on top of each other and preserve pollen, and therefore preserve a record of the vegetation that was growing at the time of pollen deposition. However, such studies have traditionally focuses, focused on changes in taxonomic composition. So looking at fact, uh, external influences, for example, things like successional change, and how they, how, they, how they influence the species <coughs> composition through time. So very few palynological studies to date have taken a functional approach. So why use traits instead of tax the taxonomy of the species? Why, why take a functional approach? So I think it's been well documented now the controls that vegetation exert on biogeochemical cycles. So the differences, for example, between fast-growing and slow-growing species in, in photostatic capacity, for example, have an influence in carbon drop drawdown and uh, no, I, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> in the carbon drawdown capacity of the environment, for example, and leaf litter quality was have an influence in the composition rate and therefore my microbial activity. So the idea here is that by estimating changes in the functional composition through time of the vegetation, we should be able to, to get an idea of how the, how, wh what kind of impact it will have on ecosystem processes uh, through time, how, how ecosystem process should change through time. 
for example, process that influence soil, soil carbon storage. So the questions that we had were, can, can we uh, infer change in ecosystem processes through the use of pineological studies? And if so, how can we use fossil pollen data to reconstruct past uh, functional composition of the vegetation? So we selected two study sites in the Finlands, in, in East Anglia, uh, one in Norfolk, actually one in Cambridgeshire. And they both are comprised of fan woodland and herbaceous fan. And in these two sites, we surveyed the vegetation growing on the peat, and we also collected modern pollen data. And by modern pollen, I mean pollen that were extracted from moss <coughs> posters growing on the surface of the peat, so pollen that was deposited recently. So we surveyed the vegetation, as I said, and we also collected plant trait data, especially leaf <coughs> traits, like leaf nutrient composition and uh, leaf dry mass to area ratio. So the fossil pollen data came from several <coughs> sites in the Finland Basin, in East Anglia, and in southern England, in Rumini Marsh. And in these sites, uh, peat cores were sampled to several depths, and at certain depths, these sediments were dated using the C14 technique, and conventional pollen analysis was, was performed. So, so pollen was extracted and identified. And I'm gonna focus on the results from Rumini Marsh here, so in southern England. So just to give an example of the kind of output we have when you do pollen analysis. This is a pollen diagram showing total land pollen and the proportion of the taxa that is identified from the pollen grains. One of the issues with, with pollen analysis is that you cannot identify all pollen grains down to species level. Some of them can only be identified down to family level and to genus level. So in order to assign trait values to the pollen taxa, what we first had to do was to create a equivalent list. So to, ident to identify the pollen taxa, to, to map the pollen taxa with the contemporary vegetation that we recorded in the Finland communities. Okay, once we've done that, we were able to assign trait values to that pollen tax, uh, weighted mean trait values, using the trait values that were recorded from the modern uh, vegetation. From that, I was able to compute community weighted means for each of the plots that we surveyed uh, in East Anglia, for both the modern vegetation and the modern pollen data. So, as a next step, what I did was to see the degree of association between the modern vegetation and the modern pollen. So to see how the traits between those two types of assemblage agree to each other. And I took the traits with the highest degrees of association between them, so the highest R squares, to then characterize the fossil pollen communities. So communities that were established in the mid to late Holocene to, 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 to try and understand the functional composition of, of past fan communities. And finally, we dated all the sediments uh, from which the pollen were extracted, so we could classify them temp temporarily uh, along uh, from mid to late Holocene, from the mid to late Holocene period. So this is another pollen diagram of the fossil pollen this time, also from Ruben Ash. Uh, you have the peat depth along the vertical axis there, and the pollen tax that could be identified from those fossil pollen assemblages. So what are the results now? First, the mapping of the modern pollen with the modern vegetation. So the intention here being how I could, uh, whether the <coughs> traits from the modern pollen could be reflected in the modern vegetation. So even though all these lobes were significant difference from zero, I chose the traits which showed me the highest degree of uh, association between them. So the highest high squares, so leaf <coughs> nitrogen concentration and the leaf delta C13. <coughs> and I also chose the LDMC as being an example of a trait of a leaf dry mass, uh, of a leaf dry mass trait. Okay, so to show you the results for the fossil pollen uh, sites from Rumini Marsh now. Along the y-axis there, I have uh, the age of the samples in thousands of calendar years before present. On the x-axis, I have the units of each one of those three traits that I just mentioned. So you have three separate graphs there. The green circles are the herbaceous fossil pollen samples and the brown circles are the wooded fossil pollen samples. So if we overlay the 100-year moving average, we can see that there hasn't been a huge amount of change in terms of trait composition of the wooded and the herbaceous communities from about five and a half thousand years before present to about 2,000 years before present. We can though see, we can however see a separation between the wooded periods and the herbaceous periods in the fossil record, especially in the leaf nitrogen concentration in the middle graph and in the leaf delta C13 uh, on the right there. So I also overlaid the means of the modern vegetation of the Finland communities we sampled. 
and those those shaded areas are the 95 percent confidence interval of the model means <coughs> So we can see here that, for example, LDMC, the wooded periods in the mid to late Holocene showed substantially higher LDMC values than in the more than what we see today in the in those Finland communities. However, the leaf nitrogen concentration, the leaf delta theta, the leaf nitrogen concentration showed similar uh, values to today's to what we recorded today. <coughs> and the fossil communities in the leaf delta C13 exam showed a lower separation between wooded and herbaceous communities than, than we see at present. So that lower separation between wooded and herbaceous communities in the fossil sample might perhaps indicate relatively wetter conditions back then in the mid to late Holocene period than at present, given the lower differences between those two types of communities. Okay, so uh, the increase in leaf nitrogen in the transition from herbaceous to wooded communities potentially uh, resulted in, in, highly, in more easily decomposable leaf litter that promoted higher microbial activity and therefore lower nutrient retention soils back in the mid Holocene period than, uh, than, uh, than when under herbaceous conditions. <coughs> the higher values we saw for the fossil wood communities compared to the present in terms of LDMC are likely reflecting the abundance of Poaceae and Separaceae pollen intrusion in the woody communities, in the fossil wooded communities. So these are grasses and sedges that have a relatively high value of LDMC. That's probably why we are seeing the difference there between the modern and the fossil uh, communities. So this is just the initial stage of the work that we are doing now. So the next step, something we're working towards too, is to use models to better reconstruct pollen, uh, pollen abundances uh, that take into account the pollen productivity and dispersal bias of different species, especially the difference between arboreal pollen and herbaceous pollen. We are also working towards using other plant organs rather than, than leaves to characterize the fossil communities and to test and, and combine these data with isotope measurements of uh, the sediments from which the fossil samples came from to better understand changes in, in ecosystem process. So just to thank Natural England and for Quad Life Trust for the access to the sites. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, any questions for Fabio? I've got a question. Um, you mentioned at the end there, um, reconstructing plant abundances through time. <coughs> um, can you then use that data to begin to ask questions about trends in ecosystem resilience in terms of the compensatory dynamics of different species through time? Well, I believe so, because one limitation we have at the moment is that we are working on pollen counts, and that doesn't exactly reflect past plant abundances. So that's why I, I mapped the modern pollen to the modern vegetation before going on to characterize the fossil assemblies. But if we work with models that take into account dispersal productive biases, of the species in terms of pollen production. Mm -hmm. Then I believe we can more accurately reconstruct past vegetation balances. Okay. Cool. Any questions from the audience? No? Yes, one. And you, you use modern trait values? Or where yes, I think yes, I've been using modern trait values yes, that, we, that we measured okay. from the modern vegetation. Thank you, Fabio. <coughs> hey, we'll just uh, wait for a minute or two before the start of leaders' talk. Feel free to converse amongst yourselves. <laughs> We've got three minutes now if you want to find Yeah, I mean, that process.
testing on the Yeah, Okay. Okay, cool. Okay, our next speaker is Lida Kai, who's going to speak to us about salt marsh restoration, the shift from a terrestrial to a marine ecosystem. And our apologies to Lida for accidentally cutting off some of her slides with the screen size. Hi, so um, my name is Lida, I'll be talking about salt marsh restoration. So what are salt marshes and why do we care about them? Salt marshes are a coastal ecosystem with herbaceous vegetation and are regularly flooded by tides. There's over 45,000 hectares of salt marshes in the UK, most of which are found on the southeast coast. They're, as you can see from this diagram, really important in providing ecosystem services and goods, one of which is coastal protection. And it is estimated that with salt marsh at the front of, um, of a seawall, can save up to 17 to 32 billion a year in protecting that seawall, because salt marshes attenuate weight energy. With this in mind, there's a, a great um, desire to recreate this environment. So what is realignment or restoration? It's a breach in a seawall and the land is allowed to flood and then regenerate back into a salt marsh. That can be done by either a natural storm breaching the seawall and then the land is allowed to regenerate or maybe more managed when they actively choose the land to flood, come in, breach the wall, let it flood again. And it can be even more managed when you actually come in and plant, plant species to help with the development of the marsh. Um, so, yeah, moving on. So what are the difference between the natural marshes and the realigned marshes? Uh, a lot of studies have been done on paired natural and realigned marshes to look at the differences, and one of which is the plant communities. That realigned salt marshes have less plant diversity compared to realigned. As you can see from this uh, graph from uh, Garbutt and Walter in 2008 with on the x-axis years since the embarkment or realignment and then a difference in the plant species richness that younger marshes are not as diverse. That study found that it could take approximately 137 years for a realigned site to reach the same plant communities, uh, same uh, research uh, species richness as a natural marsh, however it's not necessarily going to be with the same plant communities. So the aim of our project was to investigate the sediment characteristic changes of a newly realigned site in the first year of its breach, and also to determine the effect of biotubators. Biotubators are organisms that actively mix up sediment, and this can help with aerating the sediment and changing its characteristics. I will be talking about two of our hypotheses, which is that bulk density will decrease with the age of the marsh, and that the vertical transfer of nutrients will increase in areas of biotubation. So our site was down in Colchester, which was at Fingerinhoe Week site on the Cone River. So this is our site. This was the old agricultural field that was breached and flooded and currently a realigned marsh. The breach was happened on the 25th of September last year. So we looked at two different fields, old pasture field and arable field, because we wanted to see how those two uh, previous land uses will develop differently over time. We also um, sampled the natural marsh to have a comparison between how the realigned marsh is matching the natural conditions. 
the bridge of the site happened at this point. So to investigate the effect of biodurators, we planted into the salt marsh ex invertebrate exclusion chambers. There were PVC pipes, 30 centimeters in height, with eight windows cut on the sides. There was a mesh of 250 microns to exclude any vertebrates from moving in, but to allow water movement. We had three different types, three different treatments. We had our full chambers, which is this bottom um, chambers, which had a mesh, the same mesh, 250 microns, on the bottom and the top. This was to fully exclude any vertebrates from coming into our course. We also had our half chambers, which were the same, apart from no mesh on the top or the bottom. This was to allow invertebrates to come in and actually treat for the effect of our actual treatment on the marsh. We also had control chambers where it was left untouched for the marsh to develop naturally. These were placed at a random plot design in our two fields, one in the arable and one in the pasture. Each had a determination of whether it, what treatment it was and which season it correlated to. So we did <coughs> muslin samples of sediment cores, our small cores over here, and the cores were used for sediment characteristics, which were bulk density, water content, pH, salinity, and um, microbial communities. Every season, uh, so only four times, we removed our exclusion chambers to look for the same sediment characteristics, but also to look for any invertebrates present. In addition to that, we wanted to see what sediment deposition and accretion our sites had. So we had fixed quadrats placed at the top of our uh, experimental area. And we measured the difference between the top of our bar and the bottom and the top of the sediment to see how the site changes. So this is how our chambers look when we took them back into the field for process. There's actually two cockles and a worm, or a smiley face. And uh, we, we were really happy to see uh, early development of pioneer species into our site very early. So this is some of the invertebrates that we found. We had very small snails, Peringia ulvae, but we also had their rockworms, that um, had the diversity color, and some tellings and cockles. So there was clearly colonization in the area. So moving on to our results, uh, by looking at the accretion rates, we can see that our two sides were clearly developing differently. We had way more accretion and sediment deposition in our arable compared to the pasture. We we're expecting to see a lot of this affecting our other results. Moving on to bulk density. So on the x-axis is time. And it's split into three different. So initially, it's before it got flooded. In the middle is while it was fully saturated and not draining. And at the right-hand side is once our site started draining and being affected by the tides. When we look at this, uh, bulk, it's actually bulk density, so um, grams per centimeter cubed. Uh, we can see that on the top layer, the, our two fields started at the different time points. But however, over time, they, they are matching natural conditions. However, at the bottom um, depth, so the 10 to 15 centimeters, our real line side is barely changing in its bulk density and not matching any natural conditions. This can be attributed to the fact that on the top layer, we have the sediment deposition that is affecting. So we have a different sediment that we are sampling. When we look at the ammonium uh, concentration, our nutrients availability in our sediment, again, it's, it's split into, um, into the different depths and before flooding and after um, draining. We can see that our top layer is where most of the activity is happening of our nutrients. There is a great increase in the pasture field and then it's decreasing in natural marsh. Uh, however, we can see that the natural marsh is behaving quite variable over time with these two areas of our stars when we had over 1,000 milligrams per kilogram of soil of ammonia. Uh, and again, at the bottom uh, layers, we have very little effect of uh, or any uh, nutrients present. When we try to look at our exclusion chambers to see how the invertebrates are affecting and the partridges are affecting the system, when we look at the bulk density, as seen before, that the two sides are behaving quite differently. However, there is no difference between our treatments, which is good news because it means what we did did not affect how the site is developing. Um, so yeah, most of the significant difference is between the fields uh, and the depths rather than between the different conditions. When we go to look at the ammonium content 
of the site, we see the same trend of higher ammonium levels at the top, le uh, the top five centimeters and then decreasing with very little difference between the two sites. Um, there is again the difference between the two different fields behaving differently. However, we haven't seen any effect of treatment on the ammonium. So we can say that so far we haven't seen any effect of bioactivators. However, we haven't finished collecting all of the data or analyzing and collecting all of our invertebrates. So how, um, what are the differences and what does that mean for realigned sites? Um, other studies have shown that the real line marshes have two distinct sediment layers. You have the top, which is the newly accreted marine sediment, which <coughs> is finer and easier to, for water movement, but you also have the old agricultural relic layer. That means it's um, not allowing as much uh, water movement, both from groundwater as well as surface. That restricting of the water movement is affecting the hydrogeology of the system. That, me, that could explain why realigned sites are more homogeneous compared to the natural heterogeneity and variability that we see in the two sites. So to conclude, uh, we have found that our bowel density does decrease over time, but this might be due to the accretion of the new marine sediment rather than the actual change of the agricultural layer. So we still see our old agricultural relic layer remaining in our site. Um, that the two different fields are behaving quite differently. So maybe when we have, when we come to deciding if when we're realigning sites, if we have to choose more carefully which sites and which areas to flood and switch, but that will depend on what we want out of our realigned marsh. Uh, so far we haven't seen the effect of perturbation, but we have seen that the, re the natural sites are way more variable than, and heterogeneous than the realigned sites. Finally, I want to thank my supervisors, Kelly Thorin, Sylvia and Concha, which are my top, Tom, Phil, and Pierre for helping me into the field, Mark for building the chambers, D Zero Lab Group for all their help and <coughs> putting up with my mud, uh, the scholarship, and finally, it's my celebratory mud angel. I want to finish something. <laughs> Questions for you, please. Yes. Um, is there any practice of excavating land prior to it being flooded in order to try and reduce the depth of the relic layer? Yeah. Uh, would you um, recommend that as a practice? Well, it's a very fine line between. So, to be honest, I don't know for sure because it will depend. If you dig it up, then you have way more loose sediment, which can be easily eroded away when the tide comes in. So, it's a fine balance of breaking that relic layer, but I don't know how far deep you're going to have to go to break that up to make it more homogeneous and heterogeneous. Because for our exclusion chambers, we actually had to separate and dig up the soil because we saw the difference before breaking it, that there was a bit of a bulk density difference between the two, two different fields, so we kept the sediment the same. But at the same time, it was broken up, and we still didn't see a great effect of it. Um, I don't have one, but uh, there's a previous project that was running before this, which I'm also part of it, and we were looking at the same natural marsh, but at a slightly different location that we're on something, I uh, was something right now. So we've got uh, part seasonality from last year as well from it, and yet there is a great variability uh, of seasonality in that season, as well as different marshes that we were sampling. So we can see the difference. I think there's uh, more nutrient contents during a winter and then and summer and then it's fluctuating in between. Time for one or two more questions. There are any at the back there. Um, why do you think that you've got different <coughs> accretion levels on two different site types? I knew this was coming up. <laughs> right. So it was a two part bridge. It was a northern part and a southern part bridge. So um, they broke up the top, left a bit in the middle and then broke it up down a bit. So the southern part is this one, which is quite wide and most of the water is coming through the field over there, whereas the northern bridge is barely actually linking to the river. 
and the northern breach is leading to my pasture field and the southern is leading to the arable field. So because there are a lot, they left all of their draining ditches in, so I am assuming that when the tide is coming in, it doesn't bring as much sediment or whatever sediment is coming in, marine sediment, it's been deposited in those ditches by the time it overfloods to reach the uh, real line side. Um, I measured the, the levels of my two different fields and I made sure they were on the same level before putting them in because I, I, I was worried that they would be also not just the deposition but also their draining times will be different. One more quick question. I have a quick question, a boring methodological question. Um, did you consider actually measuring the rate of sediment turnover using lamina falls or anything like that? I did but we didn't have the equipment or the time to do that because I'm based up in York and it's a five hour drive down to, uh, to Colchester yeah. as well. Yeah. We, did, we don't have the equipment. I did, I did want to measure the water flow coming in as well, but we just didn't have the equipment to do it. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so our next presenter is Sarah Swinchecker, who's going to be talking to us about meta-analysis of functional restoration in wetlands. Um, yeah. So for those who've been here for the, the session, um, it follows on pretty well from Fabio and Lita's talks in that I'm looking at changes and, and development in restored wetlands over time and attempting to look at the interaction between vegetation communities and ecosystem processes, as we heard about in um, a little bit in Fabio's talk. Um, so uh, my supervisors are Peter Vasque at University of Melbourne, Jane Catford, she actually just relocated to University of Southampton. Um, so um, we've heard a bit about wetlands now already, but they're really um, valuable ecosystems, carbon sequestration, nitrogen cycling, habitat, et cetera, et cetera, and they're also incredibly diverse so these are some photos from my field sites in Australia for um, another project, and these are some of our alpine wetlands. This is a salt marsh, <coughs> a swamp along the Murray, and of course Lake Mundo. This is what we call lakes in Australia. So um, it's a really interesting question to think about when we have such a diverse um, you know, group of ecosystems and we're trying to understand their change and trying to understand how do we restore them, what goals do we restore to, and how do we assess how well we're doing against all these different metrics, it becomes quite difficult to look, um, you know, what are you supposed to be looking at? Is it species composition? Is it recovery compared to some sort of natural, natural system? In which case, what is that? Most of the data on wetlands shows that we've modified probably, you know, degraded more than 50% and modified probably all of them. So then, you know, is the comparison perhaps a historical, um, historical level of some variables? So these are the kinds of questions um, that we're starting from. So a couple years ago, David Moreno, Mateus, and colleagues put out a, a really interesting paper where they did a meta-analysis of restoration studies, and they looked at um, a, a large number of studies that encompass things. Um, Herpetology and fauna and plants and biogeochemical, and they summarized basically how they thought all of these different indicators progressed over time, and they produced um, a couple of these <coughs> graphs, and the response ratio is basically the value in the restored site, the log of the ratio of the value in the restored site um, divided by the value in the reference. So this zero line would be where the values are equivalent in the restored wetland and in the natural and um, these lines can tell us perhaps that the values in restored sites are lower than in the reference and that they maybe are not increasing um, over time. And similarly here we have a breakdown of the biological component. We have the plants in green, biased, so we'll just look at those for now. And there does seem to be an increase. But the issue here is you know, these charts are made with some value judgment. 
So if you have a ratio, if you have a variable like um, number of invasive species or density of invasive species, you have to decide is higher numbers of invasive species good or bad? That's another debate. If you decide that it is bad and you um, add a kind of negative sign to that ratio, then higher number of invasives in restored sites becomes a negative response ratio and it's under the curve. But how reasonable is that assessment on a wide range of indicators? So these um, variables encompass a lot of different metrics, right? It's species diversity, number of invasives, for the biogeochemical data, it may have been soil carbon, bulk density, nitrogen. So it's, it's combining all these various indicators into one metric, and the question is, can we combine all those things? How do we determine which ones are good and bad, and what do we compare to? Because there's also an implicit assumption here that we compare to a natural reference. So um, as we heard a bit earlier, um, uh, traits of plant communities can be really useful in understanding processes. So when I was looking at some of these results, I started thinking we have these trends in biogeochemical functions and trends in vegetation communities. Is there a link? Is there perhaps a way that we can understand the progress of both of these trends through restoration? And can traits give us that, that connection? Because we, we do know that leaf traits, root traits, community traits, they do have an impact on the functions that we then um, can expect out of our ecosystem. So um, this maybe is, is not new for some, but this idea that you have traits which respond to changes, so ones that you know vary along a flooding gradient, but also those that impact function. Um, so some effect traits in the literature would be things like leaf traits, which we've heard about already today, and how they can affect um, the decomposability of litter, soil storage, um, biomass, etc. So um, I'm asking a few things, you know, more philosophically, what's the benchmark for restoration? What do we compare to? How do we make some of these um, value decisions? And how does the functional trait composition of vegetation communities change over time? And does that help us understand development of biogeochemical functions over time. So what I did is I um, did a systematic review of the literature in the time gap since the review done by David Moreno and colleagues. And that was only four years, but it produced just as many Web of Science hits as his original search, which was, I think, from the start of time. So we're doing good, <laughs> lots of data. Um, but it, it did mean that there was quite a lot to look through. I tried to use the same search term criteria and similar, um, same uh, determination for which <coughs> then went into the later stages. Um, things like I didn't want data that was averaged over more than five years and had uh, natural reference comparisons. So um, I did the same with David's papers, as many of these included um, insect data or fauna data, and I was primarily interested in those that looked at biogeochemical data and or vegetation data. So my total data set was 80 papers. So this is just a map showing the distribution of the publications. Unfortunately, as you can see, it's highly biased. We don't, uh, you know, we've got a lot of these studies coming out of the U.S. in particular. There's a lot coming out of the Prairie Pothole region, Ohio, Wisconsin area. Um, and so that, you know, a lot of these are also opportunistic studies. So restoration is being conducted and people go in and they, they, they measure afterward. So it's, it's not quite a backy, you know, you don't have the before and after and the treatment. You don't have a very clear time series. It's often space for time um, location. And, um, you know, every wetland is, has a different degradation history was restored slightly differently. So you start to see how it's really difficult from a data perspective to really make conclusions when you have such a diverse data set. So sorry, that's a bit small, but this is just to give you an idea. These are the um, kinds of degradation <coughs> that the studies um, wetlands had. So it's everything from agriculture to um, hydrologic modification. And similarly, um, the ecosystem types 
You can see the shallow freshwater wetland is the largest, and that's um, largely from that prairie pothole region. Um, a lot of data coming out of there. So, some initial results. Um, I elected to do something a little bit different than the original paper. I didn't think it was really reasonable for me to assign signs to the ratios and to determine that you know bulk density was good or this variable was bad. But we can still look at these graphs and understand them in a similar way um, in that whether positive or negative, the further you are from zero, the more the restored wetland differs from the natural site. So it's not a very clear trend. These, these pink dots are the degraded sites. So, you know, we don't see a very, you know, clear picture here. There's obviously um, a lot more data from um, younger wetlands. And the other thing we have to remember is that these data come from a whole host of different carbon um, variables and that we're combining these to make this picture. So one question perhaps, um, which is why I've included the degraded sites, is maybe what we can do is simply ask, are the restored sites, you know, intermediary between <coughs> the natural sites and the degraded? You know, that might be a way to look at this data. Unfortunately, from what we can see here, though, even that, you know, it, it presents a confusing picture when the degraded sites seem to be closer to the natural than many of the restored. Similarly, these are the vegetation data, which was not by species. So these are the overall groups, like number of graminoids, number of invasives, and there's 56 different variables encompassed in all these studies. And here we can see a bit of a wider spread in the degraded variables, which perhaps indicates that the degraded sites have um, much further from the natural conditions than the restored seem to be. But again, this is combining across many different data types. So what I did is I took the species level data out of these um, studies and I um, collected data from the TRI um, database. And I submitted data for 582 species. And this is the distribution of what I got back. So the line at the top is my number of species so the white space kind of represents the gap in my data. So it's actually an incredible database, and this is a huge amount of data to come out of it, especially considering the diversity of species that I was including across these different ecosystems. But there's still a, a, a large gap, which presents an issue. If you're going to do a trait-based analysis, um, you know, you need to have a certain level of coverage to use that trait, or it lacks a bit of meaning. So briefly, um, we've seen this as well today, but one way to look at um, the impact of a trait community is to look at the community weighted mean, which is the sum of the um, trait value times its relative abundance summed over the species in a community. And the response ratio that I then used for this data was the log ratio of the community weighted mean of the restored sites over the control, and you add one to make sure you don't have negative values. So this is a bit small, but um, this is one you know, beginning result that we can see. And we've got um, a small amount of data that in had enough uh, coverage of leaf dry matter content. And what we see, if this is the zero line, is that the vast majority of these points are below the line, which may indicate lower values of dry matter content in restored wetlands, which may imply You've got more herby species and fewer uh, reeds or, or others that are more carbon dense. The problem um, with this graph, among many, is um, as we can see, the age that we've gotten to is only 12.5. So while the original data set encompasses up to quite a long period of time, when you figure that you can only use the sites which have this trait data for enough of the species in the community, it significantly reduces the number of comparisons that, that you have. So it, it poses an interesting question on how, do, how can we use this trait data and these trait metrics given the um, 
given using database um, variables, you don't have as good of coverage. So um, bouncing off this, some of my other PhD work is looking at ways that we can more clearly link the um, impact of traits like least dry matter content on the functions that we're interested <coughs> in. So for example, decomposition experiments that look at the relationship between the um, chemical composition of litter and the resulting um, functional impact. And these kinds of empirical studies may be what we need moving forward because larger comparisons using the databases is not um, uh, as possible when you have these gaps. And that perhaps empirical studies that better try and link this, um, um, the, the tie between the trait and the function that it relates to will allow us to increase our power in making these analyses in the future. So I'm running out of time, so I'll just conclude with that. Um, we still lack you know, really consistent benchmarks to understand how we restore and why we restore and how we measure these things. And that you know, while soil processes are related to traits such as leaf dry matter content or perhaps um, functional dispersion, um, you know, it is tricky to do these analyses over large databases which um, have a lot of variation. Um, but there is promising indications for the future. And on that, this analysis is obviously not done. I haven't done any of my meta-regression. If you have any comments at all, um, feel free to get in touch. Um, it's definitely a work in progress. And I'd like to thank my supervisors and, of course, David for the data and my funding from the Holdsworth Wildlife Research Center. Time for one very quick question. There is one. Okay, we'll have to move on, I'm afraid, because it's time. Okay, our next speaker is Lewis Bartlett, who's going to talk to us about synergistic impacts of habitat loss and fragmentation on model ecosystem structure. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Lewis. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Exeter, but today I'm going to be talking about some work that I started prior to my PhD under the broader title of Testing Ecosystems in Virtual Reality, which hopefully fits with the novel approaches to ecosystem function that's characterising this session. More specifically, um, a study which we published earlier this year under the title of Synergistic Impacts of Habitat Loss and Fragmentation on Model Ecosystems. And I'd just like to take this time at the very start of the session to thank my co-authors, Tim Newbold, Drew Purvis, Dr. Titanzor and Mike Harfoot for no small amount of patience and excellent mentorship over the last three and a half years of me finally getting this work out. So I'm going to start by just talking more broadly about the premise and background within which I'd like to frame the research and then I'll move on into the specific details of the study that we published earlier on this year. So, as ecologists in the modern day, um, amongst both ourselves and amongst policymakers, we're faced with all sorts of choices in how we manage our landscapes, and in particular how we spatially arrange many of the impacts which we have on the natural world. Examples include the Sloss debate, whether or not it's better to have a single large or several small protected areas, or the debate of land sharing, so-called wildlife friendly farming, versus land sparing. And I'd actually just like to point out that earlier this week an absolutely fantastic and thorough review of spatial challenges in landscape management was published by Linda Donsell Donaldson, so please do give that a look. And in approaching these challenges, we as ecologists often look for new and novel techniques, new kits in our toolbox, so to speak, and when we, when we looked at other challenges that face modern ecology, we might look to something like climate change. And as far as climate change goes, there's been huge success in employing very sophisticated, quite complicated Earth system models, which are able to predict under different scenarios of CO2 or methane emission, how that will influence the atmosphere. <coughs> and the question was posed as to whether or not the same can be done in ecology when looking at ecosystem function in the face of challenges such as these landscape level decisions, whether or not we can employ sophisticated, complicated simulation based methods in order to predict the outcomes of alternative futures. This is a question first posed by Drew Perves and his colleagues in 2013 in a Nature comment, and it led to the development of the Maddingly General Ecosystem Model, which is designed as an ecological study tool um, where ecosystems emerge from interacting individuals overlaying a real world climate. It was published in 2014, having broadly recreated um, biomass patterns across the globe 
and we decided to test this model, this non-purpose built model, to see how it would fare in tackling smaller scale landscape level challenges and whether or not it was able to predict and differentiate between different scenarios which policymakers or we as ecologists might be faced when it comes to mitigating our impacts on ecosystem function. So just to quickly summarise how Maddingly works, ecosystems are formed of a grid made of many cells overlaying a real world climate and then the ecosystem emerges from individuals within that interacting to form a cohesive network of, that is defined by functional, um, functional trait based individuals. There's no taxonomic species in this. There's no top down instruction as to what the ecosystem should look like. It's purely based on the interactions of these individual agents within the model. And then within each cell, we have all the fundamental processes which tend to characterize a functioning ecosystem. We have metabolism, photosynthesis, predation, eating, growth, mortality, reproduction, and dispersal. And from this, we get something of an approximation of an ecosystem anywhere on the globe that has a decent um, climate envelope. So now that I've covered the broad premise within which I'd like to frame this talk, I'll move over into the specific study which we published earlier this year, uh, where we set out to compare the ecological responses to different land use scenarios, so how the functionality of the pristine ecosystem changes in response to alternative scenarios of impact, where our impact was the removal of autotroph biomass. So we went into the ecosystem and we pulled out a load of the plant biomass and see to see how the ecosystem function and how the um, characteristics and structure of that ecosystem changed in response to this perturbation. And our focus was on whether the spatial pattern of this removal affected the ecosystem response in particular, whether fragmented versus contiguous spatial, um, spatially arranged impact affected how the ecosystem responded and whether those two different scenarios would influence the function of the ecosystem following the perturbation. We also just generally more looked to see how Maddingly performed. This is one of the first studies to look at a smaller scale study using this new ecological study tool. So quite generally, we were just curious to see what it would do. So to conceptually describe the kind of comparisons we were making, I have here a four panel graph showing um, differences in configuration, random and continuous, approximating a fragmented or a contiguous scenario of habitat destruction or degradation. And then we have differences in extent and intensity, extent being the number of grid cells from which we pluck plant biomass, and intensity being the amount of plant biomass that we take out of an individual cell. And across these four different panels, we have approximately the same amount of plant matter being pulled out of the ecosystem, about 25%, with the top row showing a quarter of the cells having all their plant biomass taken out, and the bottom row, half the cells having half their plant biomass removed. Uh, we simulated this within the context of northern Kenya, that's the climate envelope which we used, partly because there's still extant charismatic megafauna there, which relatively better represent the pristine ecosystems that Mandingly generates. And we simulated it at two scales, one one hundredth the size of the other. This was to some degree to test the generality of Maddingley's findings, but it also encapsulates the extreme sizes of the protected areas in Kenya, which do host still things like giraffes and rhinoceros and other important charismatic megafauna, which are crucial for functioning ecosystems. So to labour the point of how many scenarios we compared a little bit more, we stepped up our extent and intensity in steps of 25% from zero to 100. Coupled with our random versus continuous, our fragmented versus contiguous impacts, this led to 29 scenarios simulated at our two scales and replicated 10 times. So we had 580 simulations. And that doesn't sound like many, but it was computationally very, very difficult to finally get these to run. We ran them for about 200 years, and Maddingly is by no means um, a simple thing. It needs a little bit more than a laptop, unfortunately. So to jump into the results, the first thing we looked at was a metric of ecosystem function or a change in ecosystem function and structure, which we devised for this study. We envisaged it as a very coarse understanding of how the structure of the ecosystem might change, which we dubbed trophic skew. The concept being that our perturbation was the removal of plant biomass from a pristine ecosystem represented here by a very simple trophic pyramid of plants, herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores and that if we remove a proportion of the plant biomass and see relatively similar reductions in the biomass at every trophic level up the pyramid, we would give this a very low skew value. It was calculated, but essentially this would be a skew close to zero. Conversely, if we perturb the ecosystem and its function and structure changes drastically, 
we might see disproportionate losses of biomass at certain trophic levels, and this would yield a very high skew. We consider this quite a coarse measure of a very fundamental change in the ecosystem structure and function. So to show how this changed across our different scenarios, I have here a four panel gra graph split by our small scale and large scale, our random, our fragmented, and our continuous, our contiguous, and then we have increasing extent of impact and increasing intensity of impact on the X and Y respectively. Uh, do note the logarithmic color scale on this graph, showing that there was strong synergism um, a strong non-linear response in this metric across the ecosystem, which to some extent makes sense as we see some resilience, especially in the larger simulations, to quite mild perturbations and overall higher skew in the smaller ecosystems. That is that smaller patches of habitat appear to be functionally and structurally much more sensitive to perturbation than larger equivalent um, ecosystems. We also saw higher skew in frag fragmented scenarios of land impact, that is that Frag equivalent, contiguous and fragmented scenarios of plant harvesting yielded greater changes in ecosystem structure and function when they were fragmented, i.e. fragmentation is detrimental. And crucially, this fragmentation effect was stronger in the smaller habitat patches, and I didn't find this result that intuitive, that a smaller patch of habitat would be more vulnerable to, fra to fragmentation than a larger one. The second results I'd like to talk about, we looked specifically at the heterotrophs in the system, and we focused only on pure fragmentation here, just a quarter of the scenarios where we either had destroyed habitat or pristine habitat. There was no semi-habitable matrix for the heterotrophs to move through. And in this 12-panel graph, we have herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores, and increasing severity of population collapse up the Y and increasing extent along the X. And broadly, what we can see is that there's more severe declines when the perturbation, when the harvesting is fragmented, shown by the change in concavity between the fragmented and the contiguous impacts, and that there was a very strong mass bias. The increasing warmth of the colours in these graphs represents larger animals, and these bigger animals were much more sensitive to these changes in the ecosystem, and that crucially, this mass bias was exacerbated by fragmentation. Larger animals were not only more sensitive in our simulated ecosystems, totals removing plant biomass, but that sensitivity was exacerbated when that impact was done in a fragmented manner. Finally, the last result I'd like to discuss was something of a surprise. It wasn't something we were looking for, but something that did occur in the simulations. And that was that across every simulation broadly, there appeared to be far more plant biomass in the system than we would have predicted. We can make this prediction because we have a baseline for our pristine simulations. We know how much plant biomass we're extracting because that's our measure of ecosystem perturbation. And in almost every instance, this prediction was lower than what we saw actually in the simulations. Um, and we turn this to compensatory response. So just again to display this in the same style of four panel graph, please note the linear color scheme on this one, however. We can see that it was slightly more extreme in the smaller simulations, so smaller habitat patches showed a stronger compensatory response, but there was a negligible effect of spatial structure in this case. Um, I do promise that there are differences between um, moving side to side on these panels, and it was almost absent from cases of 100% with impact removal, that is complete habitat destruction within a cell. And that does to some extent explain why there was no effect of spatial configuration, because whatever fundamental mechanism underpinning ecosystem function that's driving this is it's happening at a very local scale within the grid cell in which we're removing plant biomass. So to finish off with some conclusions, fragmentation is broadly detrimental compared to equivalent contiguous habitat losses. This is something that seems intuitively obvious but it's actually been quite difficult to prove empirically because it's so difficult to separate habitat loss from habitat fragmentation and we are rarely given opportunities to compare contiguous or fragmented removal or destruction of habitat. It disproportionately affects large animals, which leads to fundamental shifts in the functioning and structure of the ecosystems. It's particularly disruptive in less extensive ecosystems, and again, I'd consider this the least intuitive finding of this study, that a smaller patch of habitat is more vulnerable to fragmentation than a larger one. I wouldn't consider that an obvious result. And that, crucially, fragmentation, in, when studied in this separable, um, fully factorial design, acts synergistically with other, habitat, other aspects of habitat loss 
And those of you familiar with the habitat fragmentation literature will know there's been some debate about whether or not it's worthwhile considering habitat loss and fragmentation holistically as a single process. And my view is that this acts in strong evidence of doing so because the two do interact and can't be considered as independent acting effects on, on ecosystem function. And finally, we have evidence for top-down control governing vegetation responses when we're removing plant biomass from otherwise pristine ecosystems and that if this holds true, the magnitude of this effect possibly warrants consideration not only in other ecological models looking at structure and function, but also in carbon stock modelling with 75% increased plant biomass not being a negligible amount when discussing um, the effects of forest clearance on CO2, for example. So, thank you all for the opportunity to speak and time permitting, I'd like to open the floor to questions and comments. So, there's a, a pretty important assumption that needs to be made in this sort of modeling exercise. Uh, if there's going to be impacts on the, uh, the biomass represented by primary consumers, secondary mm -hmm. consumers of the net primary production, we have to know something about trophic efficiency. Mm -hmm. And there's been some work that has suggested that maybe higher trophic levels would have higher trophic efficiency as well, which might mitigate some of the effects that we're talking about here. So, I'm just wondering, how does your model take into consideration trophic efficiency, uh, the amount of energy that's available to convert into biomass at higher trophic levels, so on? Um, so it depends on the functional traits of the individuals that, are, that you're looking at within the model. So omnivores, for instance, are less efficient at, gather, at taking in biomass from autotrophs and heterotrophs compared to carnivores versus pure herbivores. So there is some variation um, across the network in their ability to sequester biomass. I think it would be worth. Hmm? Yeah, of course. Um, I think it would be worth tweaking the parameters of the sensitivity. speaker is Andrew Lucas, who's going to be talking to us about DNA metabarcoding reveals the role of hoverflies in pollen transport in grasslands. Tom, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you much to the, the BES for giving me an opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I actually have a day job. I work for Natural Resources Wales, which is the Welsh Government's advisor on biodiversity and the environment. But in 2011, I went part-time to go back to school to do a PhD, uh, which is just drawing to a close now. And I'm going to talk to you today about some of the results that are coming out of that. When you see pollination uh, in the media, in the popular press, um, it's always the amazing mutualisms that get the attention. The orchid that has one species of fly that pollinates it. But we know that now that pollination networks generally are not like that. In fact, they tend to be generalised, with plants having a number of different pollinators, and pollinators in turn visiting a number of different plant species. And this goes back to the mid-90s and two key papers on this subject there. And since then, generalisation has been demonstrated in a number of different habitats, including arable weed communities, boreal forests, and urban areas. So the question is, if pollination networks are structured like this, how do plants ever get pollinated? And this was the subject of a nice paper by Barry Brosey at Emory University of Atlanta, when he proposed that specialization and generalization in pollination networks could actually exist at the same time at different levels of, of hierarchy. Now, to be fair, this isn't an original idea. In fact, the, the, the seed of this idea goes back to Aristotle. But Brosey was a nice summation, if you like, of where we are with this uh, particular subject right now. So this is something that I wanted to explore in my PhD. And these are my study animals, the Aristalis hoverflies. They're very common. If you have a garden in Britain, you'll probably have them in your garden. They, as adults, they feed exclusively on nectar and pollen. As larvae, they are, exist as rat-tailed maggots in uh, eutrophic waterlogged conditions. And I get six species on my sites. And these are my sites. We're in southwest Wales here, and I've got four sites for this part of the study on the edge of the Brecon Beacons National Park. 
For those of you familiar with the MVC, they are M24 me Fen Meadows. These are basically uh, basin rich, quite species rich uh, um, mires in lowland situations. So what did I do? Well, I collected Aristalis hoverflies from these four sites in two time periods, from the beginning of June through to the middle of July, early summer, and from mid-July through to the end of August, late summer. I washed the pollen from the hoverflies, metabarcoded the pollen to, to identify it, and then I generated interaction networks using the bipartite package in R. It's worth talking a little bit about how the metabarcoding actually works. Um, you retrieve your pollen, uh, you extract your DNA, you amplify it using the, uh, the standard plant uh, barcode RBCL. You sequence the DNA on the Illumina MySeq platform and then you compare it to a reference library of barcodes for, for plants across the UK. And this is possible because uh, Britain now has, well certainly Wales was the first country in, to, in the world to have a complete DNA uh, barcode reference uh, library for all its native plants. And this has already been used uh, by my colleague Jenny Hawkins in her PhD to look at um, the origins of honey. So, results. Um, we managed to retrieve pollen sequences from 180 hoverflies. That was 55 in the early period, 125 in the late period. We got 63 different plant taxon groups that we could identify. And this was a big surprise. This was a lot more than I was expecting. Uh, and as you'll see in a moment, bramble was absolutely key in the early part of the season. And that blue flower on the right, Saxiza pretensis, the devil's bit scabious, was an important plant for hoverflies in the later part of the summer. Now we analyze them using the bipartite package in R, and this generates a number of different networks that describe uh, network structure. So we, uh, we generated something called H2, which looks at the overall network generalization. D, which looks at the specialization or generalization of individual species. And then we also uh, calculated Pilu's J, which is a measure of individual specialization by individual insects. So, results at the network level. Uh, H2 runs from 0, which is completely generalized network, through to 1, which is a completely <coughs> specialized network. And those were the results. For those of you who can't see at the back, um, basically all the values were substantially below 0.5. Well, what, they were all below 0.5, some substantially so. So they were closer to the generalized end of the spectrum than the specialized end of the spectrum. So basically my results all fit in with what we already know about the structure of pollination networks. When we looked at the value of D, it was a bigger table, so this is just the edited highlights. D works in the same way. Zero, very generalized. One, very specialized. In the early period, values ranged from uh, 0.3, no, sorry, 0.03 to 0.34 so quite uh, generalized. In the later period, values were from 0.02 to 0.51. So again, my species were quite generalized. There were very few exclusive interactions going on uh, between uh, my hoverflies and the different plants. But when we get to individual insects, the situation is slightly different. Uh, J, Pilus J runs in the opposite direction, just to make things, just to keep you going. Um, J, if it's low, you are specialized, uh, zero. If it is one, you are generalized. And in the early period, on the left-hand side of the graph here, you can see that values of J were really quite low, all below 0.5, some quite close to zero. So individuals appear to be quite specialized. In the later part of the period, um, you can see, watch out for the change in scale on the, on the graph, by the way. Um, again, most values were below 0.5. In other words, closer to the specialized end of the spectrum than the generalized end of the spectrum. And when we compared between the early and late period, there was a significant difference in the values of J between early and late. Thank you. In other words, um, insects are significantly more specialized in the early part of the season than the late. 
Now, when you've got this kind of data, you can generate uh, pollinate, pollination transport networks. This is an awful diagram for you at the back, but stay with me. I'm going to talk you through it. So, the black lines at the top are my hoverfly species. So, you can see at site LLC in the early part of the, the study, I caught three. I managed to retrieve pollen from three different species of Aristalis hoverfly. The black lines along the bottom are the plants, the pollens that they were carrying. The bars are proportional to the amount of pollen that they were, they were, they were carrying. Uh, and the ribbons between the two essentially describe the strength of the interaction network between the two. And you can see this big band here, this is bramble. So in the early part of the season at this site they were going overwhelmingly for bramble. But there were other things in there as well. The APAC here, the umbellifers, uh, the rosa, roses, uh, ranunculus, the, butterf uh, the, the butterflies, the buttercups, and over on your right there, Sambucus nigra, elder. Now, also, I draw your attention to this tiny little sliver here. That is Succiza pretensis, devil's bit scabious. It doesn't flower in the early part of the season, maybe just starting to come into flower uh, in the middle of July. So contrast that situation with what happened in the second half. Okay, same situation. We've got five species at site LLC that we've got pollen from this time. There's bramble. They're still going for it, but in, in nowhere near the same amount. Succiza pretensis has expanded here. A lot of Succiza pretensis pollen being, being moved around. The cardui here, the thistles and the knapweeds. What else is there? There's hypericum, the St. John's worts. Uh, Philopendula, Ulmeria, Meadowsweet. So, a note of caution. Three notes of caution. Actually, there are a lot of notes of caution, but here are three. Pollen transport does not equal pollination. In fact, there was a nice paper by Gavin Ballantyne and, and co-workers who looked at uh, bumblebees in um, heathland habitats, and they showed that networks, when you actually look at pollination, can be rather more specialised than if you look, just look at pollen transport. This is just 180 hoverflies in four fields in West Wales. So it's quite a limited study. And it's just one genus of hoverflies, Aristalis. Although I'm working on a, uh, another chapter of my, my thesis, we'll actually look at uh, 11 species in five genera so we can compare what's going on. But despite that, the take-home messages are DNA metabarcoding can be a, a, a useful tool to actually investigate pollen transport networks. Aristalis networks in this study were generalised at the, both the overall le uh, network level and at the species level. But they showed some degree of specialisation when you look at individual insects. And this gives some support to the idea that these generalised networks are actually some kind of emergent property, if you like, of a large number of individual uh, specialising insects. So I'll just finish with a nice quote actually from the Brosey paper. He said, a single highly specialised foraging bout is typically just one facet of a pollinated rich lifetime of interactions with multiple plant species. But that specialised bout may also be key in supporting plant reproduction. So thanks to my supervisors, Dan Former and Penny Nayland at Swansea University, and Natasha Devere at the National Botanic Garden. Also thanks to Owen, Col, and Matt, who helped in various parts of this study. Uh, all my landowners who allow me to chase hoverflies across their land. And thanks to you for listening. Thank you. Um, fantastic talk. There's a reasonable wealth of literature discussing why we see individual level specialisation in bees, for instance, because they have to learn to access pollen from specific flowers. However, my understanding of hoverflies is they're just incidental pollinators. They don't actually connect, collect pollen themselves. They're just looking for nectar. So my question to you is, what do you think is driving the individual level specialisation amongst these hoverflies if they are having to learn anything about specific flowers at all? Well, they do collect pollen. Certainly the females need pollen for um, egg production. So they do collect pollen as well. Um, 
it's, uh, there's a little bit of debate about this, but um, whether it's actually uh, a cognitive limi limitation, if you like, on the part of the flies, um, or whether there's some actual um, foraging strategy going on here, where the flies are basically making, if you want, making the judgment, if you like, that I know that I can get what I want from Devil's Bit Scavius right now, I'm going to skip past all these other flowers that I don't know anything about and go to another Devil's Bit Scavius that I know is going to work. So, yes, there are, it, it's hard to know whether it's actually a cognitive problem or whether there's an actual strategy going on there. Time for more questions from the audience? Any more? Uh, Callum? Uh, yeah, hi, hi. Great. I was just noticing that with the devil with the scale, obviously you mentioned it sort of crept into your, your early season yeah. network. I was just wondering what controls you included to to um, check for cross sample contamination sort of within the, the lab processing part of the study. Oh well the, it's you as you know well no no the, the field is a messy place. Mm. Um, but obviously once the samples come into the lab they don't touch one another in effect. So uh, our sort of our methodology was pretty strict to make sure that uh, samples are you know, not contaminated in any way. So it was just standard you know, um, molecular lab procedures. I say that. It's, for a field ecologist, it was quite a revelation. We'll have to move on there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. speaker in this session is Angela Stratov, who is going to speak to us about a modified root exudate collection method preserves grassland species, root integrity and protects among species. Okay. Um, well, thanks everyone for being here and uh, to the conveners for um, giving me this slot this afternoon. Um, the work I'll be presenting this afternoon is um, part of uh, a BBSRC funded project uh, held by my supervisor, Francisca de Vries. Um, and we've been collaborating on this with um, Halbir Muhammad Ali and Roy Goodacre at the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology. And Graham Fox provided um, technical support throughout this um, experiment. So I'll just start by um, giving a bit of context of the system that we're interested in. We're learning more and more um, over the last few years of how critical the below ground plant traits are for modifying the soil environment, but then how that also scales up into uh, providing ecosystem services uh, across a broader scale. So what we're, one of the traits that I'm specifically interested in um, is the contribution of plant roots um, to the soil organic carbon pool in the form of labile carbon or what's also known as root exudates. So root exudates are um, carbon compounds that are either actively or passively released from the plant roots into the soil environment. Uh, and they're quite important um, because they provide a very bioavailable um, substrate for microorganisms. And as they're consuming these compounds, they're feeding back um, to, uh, sorry, they're potentially feeding back um, into these plant traits. And so this cycle is kind of established where the microbes may then be modifying the uh, compounds that the plants are releasing. And when we um, consider broader ecosystem services that, this, uh, that these root exudates could then, through the microbial community, um, be contributing to, there's uh, carbon sequestration in, um, in the formation of more stable, uh, long-term stored carbon, um, after modification by the microbial community of the root exudates. Um, and alternatively, that can be turned over and released from the soil environment um, into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Um, so when we consider how um, these plant traits through the root exudates could be modifying the environment and more broadly modifying uh, ecosystem functions, it becomes really important to consider the best way to characterize these exudates um, before we can answer any ecological questions from them. Um, the problem with um, these exudate collection procedures are they're notoriously difficult to preserve the integrity of the root exudates because these compounds are so bioavailable, they're so labile, um, and they're released immediately from the plant into the soil environment where they're um, yeah, basically taken up and in the soil solution. Um, so I'll just go over a couple methods that are typically used to um, 
to characterize these compounds, you can, for instance, collect leachate or passively collect a soil solution. Um, but the advantage of this, obviously, is that you're not disturbing the plant in any way, you're maintaining um, its environment, and so it's, it's kind of a more passive um, collection procedure. But you're at the same time extracting a soil solution, and your root exudates are basically just <coughs> one um, proportion of, of uh, this carbon slurry that you're collecting uh, from the soil itself. Secondly, you could um, remove the problem of the soil solution by measuring plants in a hydroponic solution, but then you've removed um, any of the root physical traits that could be developed while the plant is growing in soil. So it's not necessarily representative of the system you would measure um, if these plants were actually growing uh, and had kind of physical challenges and, and developing a more representative rooting structure. Finally, you could um, grow these plants in soil, and this is probably what's most commonly done, and then root, uh, sorry, wash the soil away from the roots so that you have your soil washed away, you have your roots in isolation, and you can allow these roots to then exude their um, exudate compounds into, for instance, a sterile water solution. Um, the problem with that is root uh, washing is quite damaging to root tissue, um, and so probably what you're measuring in conjunction with any exudates that are released are any intracellular compounds from root tissue that you've damaged by washing. So when we kind of considered all these approaches, when we were designing our first experiment to collect root exudate, what we obviously wanted to choose from among those was the most um, ecologically relevant method that preserved the integrity of the roots themselves, but also reflected how those roots um, had formed in a soil environment. Um, so as a sort of pilot experiment, we decided to um, compare across methods and see the differences that we could measure back. So um, we did um, keep um, soils, or sorry, we did keep roots, we grew plants independently in soil, and one of our treatment was to collect exudates from um, pots that we leached. So these were our sort of intact um, soil plant systems. We compared that to um, plants that we also grew in soil, but then washed right before our exudate collection by moving the freshly washed roots into a sterile water solution and allowing the plant to exude into that. Um, and thirdly, we kind of developed this sort of hybrid hydroponic soil system where we grew the plants um, in the same system as the leached and freshly washed soils. But one week prior to root exudate collection, we transferred them to a hydroponic solution that we made from a soil solution extracted from the same soil that the plants had been growing in. So what we considered to be most reflective of the soil environment that the plants were accessing anyway. And so we transferred, um, and so we transferred the plants from the soil environment to the hydroponic solution, and we gave them one week to regenerate their root tissue um, in equilibrium in this system. And finally, we repeated that treatment, um, but just prior to exudate collection, um, we <coughs> treated the hydroponic roots the same way as the freshly washed roots, um, so that any damage um, in the root washing would be reflected um, in those roots that we'd taken from the hydroponic system. And we repeated this in four grassland species um, that are the most common grassland species at uh, one of our field sites in the Yorkshire Dales. <coughs> um, so once we had the exudates collected, uh, we filtered them to 0.2 micrometers um, to exclude any microbial biomass, and we froze these and concentrated them um, by freeze drying, and then this was these samples were derivatized and run on a GCMS to test for um, relative abundance of compounds. Um, and so when we got the root exudate profiles back from um, the GCMS column, what we saw was a, a dramatic clustering of the soil, uh, sorry, the freshly washed roots and the hydroponics and the hydroponic roots that we had damaged, um, separating from the soil that we had, or sorry, the root exudate that we had identified in the leachate collected. But what we saw less of um, was a species effect within those, um, within those four treatments. Um, so from all the treatments combined, we had 18 putatively identified compounds and the most significant effect, uh, the most significant treatment effect that we had 
uh, within those compounds was caused by the treatment method that we used for collection. And to a lesser degree, we could detect differences among species variation. Um, so what you see here are the differences in mean peak area for, um, between treatments. Um, so, sorry, I realize it's probably difficult to read at the back, but um, on the leftmost column, you have the largest difference in mean peak area of all the 18 compounds that we found back in the GCMS was between the hydroponics that we um, didn't damage before exited collection and the leachate that we collected. And the lowest degree of difference that we measured were between the hydroponics uh, that we didn't damage before exited collection and the hydroponic group that we did damage before exited collection. And I just realized I'm uh, missing extra asterisks here, but um, the differences between treatments were significant um, between the undamaged hydroponics, the leachate, the damaged hydroponics, and the leachate, the intact hydroponics, and the freshly washed roots, and the damaged hydroponics, and the freshly washed roots. Um, so this tells us that actually the, um, the hydroponic system was not significantly different from um, either the freshly washed roots, so you could theoretically um, get the same signal back from uh, just washing the roots and then collecting exited that way. But what we were also interested in was learning how we could potentially maintain uh, the integrity of the physical structure of the roots. And so what we did um, with two of the species was develop a root hair density uh, measurement method. And we did that by um, randomly cutting root tips from four points on each species um, that we took from the hydroponics and the freshly washed root systems. And those were stained with tripan blue and um, scanned so that the, um, sorry, so that if we cut out the primary root tissue here and just measured the root hairs that extended laterally from the primary root, then we could um, have a measurement. Oh, and it's cut off at the bottom, but these are, sorry, this is Cynosaurus cristatus and this is uh, Poetry realis. And what we measured were significantly higher densities of root hair that extended from a primary root uh, when, the so when the plants had been able to regenerate in the hydroponic solution, as opposed to a lower density when they'd been freshly washed uh, and, and measured. So what we're suggesting here is that, the, is that not only is the root tissue allowed to, to regenerate once after one week in hydroponics, but also the root hair are the root hairs um, are establishing them reestablishing themselves in this system as well. Um, so because of that, combined with um, the differences that we were measuring in the GCMS profiles that we got back from these. Um, we conclude that the hydroponic system we've developed allowed the root tissue, including the root hairs, to regenerate and is probably um, the most representative of what you would find in a more passive um, root exit collection procedure. And these compounds um, were most different from the leachate uh, collection, but what we um, hope to do in a follow-up experiment is, um, is optimize this collection procedure and then if we can find back compounds that we've collected uh, from roots isolated from the soil environment and uh, find them in the leachate that we can collect, then we can scale these projects up into uh, a field scenario where we're interested in, um, in looking at mixed communities. And finally, we'll be linking this with molecular analysis of the soil microbial community um, to see if we can elucidate more um, feedback trends uh, that I described at the beginning of the talk. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll take the questions. Thank you, Angela. Yes. I'm just wondering uh, two things. Why do you know what you collect is exudate? And second, if you just qu qualify whatever you find uh, uh, you have no idea whether this is important or not. So uh, my question is, is there any attempt at finding quantitative amount driven assays? I mean, you know, if it's true, some molecules may always be around, may not even be plant-borne, maybe bacterial. 
So without knowing how much, how can you give weight to the to the different compounds? Okay, so going to take your question as two parts, and the first is you is is how do we know that yeah. these are exudates? So I mean, especially with the um, especially with the roots that we've taken from the hydroponic system, once we're um, once we've removed them from the hydroponic system, we rinse them in a sterile water, so we release or so we remove um, any kind of yeah remnant soil carbon that was in the solution and then we transfer that to a sterile water solution and we leave that for two hours to exude. So the plant is still living. Of course it's possible that there's residual carbon on, on the surface of the roots, um, but at best we can hypothesize that any carbon leached is, is a result of exudation. Um, and in that case, in that short span of time, I'm not sure what an alternative source of carbon would be. Like you well, would, would which quantity you allow to be considered present. Sure, and yeah, okay, and that's the problem with GCMS and how we're only looking at, at relative abundance of the compounds. But I think in this experiment, what we're mostly establishing is like a proof of concept that we can find compounds that we know also from the literature are linked back to. Um, to physiologically relevant plant compounds that are released during growing conditions. And so once we kind of have that baseline profile, then I think it becomes interesting to, to either manipulate the environment or stress the plant and look back for those compounds and how they, and how they change. And in that case, then we'd be interested in looking at more, um, more quantities that you'd use, for instance, LCMS to determine. Any more questions from the audience? Yes? So what about the, like, using, um, you know, stabilized soil carbon that we teach in the water water? Yeah, yeah, that, that would be a fantastic way to, to scale this up and kind of, you know, follow them through the actual system. And I think especially once we start considering um, the, the uptake by the microbial community of the compounds that we're interested here, then labeling becomes, becomes critical for answering those mm -hmm. questions. Yeah. Any more questions? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So I was recently involved in setting up a mesocosm experiment where we put a lot of plants into chambers of sand. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the experiment, we had to rinse the sand out from the roots and try and separate out the plant biomass. Mm -hmm. And that was incredibly difficult for us to do and mm -hmm. keep the, the plants intact. And you mentioned scaling your experiment up was into it a- Was it difficult to do or impossible to do? It was impossible. Yes, <laughs> it was impossible. Um, you mentioned scaling your experiment up into a multi-species system, and mm -hmm. I just wondered how you would get around that problem. Yeah, so the so we're s sort of getting around that problem um, by so I showed the plants that I showed in isolation here. When we've grown them in mixed communities, what we're going to be looking back for in those mixed communities and using these individual species profiles yeah. uh, as like an indicator of then what we should find back in these mixed communities. But like you said, it's really difficult, if not impossible, to actually separate mm -hmm. these, these species out from the we low ground. We did a bad so job. We did, we did all right. <laughs> <laughs> it took us a long time, but we did all right. Yeah, but, the, but I mean, again, the problem is, or sorry, maybe the opportunity is, if we can relate these compounds that we're finding back to root traits that we would then measure um, when we have the when we have these mixed communities, then we can use either their biomass um, or uh, their tissue density or, or other traits that we're measuring as indicators of what compounds we would expect to find back. Yeah, okay, cool. Thank you very much, Angela. Thank you. That's the end of this session. Just remains for me to thank all of our speakers in the session and wish you all a happy rest of your conference. Thank you.